Welcome to section 3.8 where we're going to discuss mutation types. Now when we talk about mutations, what we're really talking about is a change in the sequence of DNA. So these particular nucleotides that you have in a row, these are the A's, T's, C's, and G's we've talked about. So the particular sequence of those is what determines the protein that we make. Now if we change that DNA sequence, if we change one or more of those nucleotides, we can ultimately get depending on the situation, a different protein. Now sometimes we change things in a sequence that does not code for a protein, like those introns we talked about. And so this is the most common type of mutation where we ultimately don't end up changing anything overall. You know, we change DNA that doesn't matter that much, or we change DNA in a way that we still get the same amino acid. So overall it's kind of like a no harm, no foul type thing. Now sometimes we will go through and we'll change something and we'll get a different protein, one that doesn't do as good of a job, or we'll get one that does a completely different job and doesn't even do that one well. You know, So ultimately, one way or another, we are worse off than how we started. Now, this one's the second most common, but it's not the only other way that things can go down. Mutations can occasionally change things for the better. So this is kind of like playing the lottery, in most cases, it's probably going to come out bad for you. You're a little poorer, but occasionally someone does win, and obviously that's going to be considered good. And so occasionally we can change something where it either makes the protein that it was function better. So it'd be kind of like if you change something in your car and it starts to run better than it did. Or you can change something that was not essential, and it becomes something new. It does a new job, but that's still way better because I didn't need the old job. You know, I didn't ultimately need something in my house. Maybe like you never use a, we'll pick like bread maker, something people get that they don't typically really want a lot. So you don't need that bread maker, but somehow that bread maker gets converted and instead now it becomes like a big screen TV, a new job. You might just be like, this is way better because I wasn't really using this. I didn't need it that much before. But now that I have this new thing that's going on, I'm way better off than I was before. So that would be a good mutation. We change things to actually improve things. Now, we talk about mutations so much because we have these genes. We've got thousands of them. And they code for specific things. So one example gene would be eye color. Now, for this gene of eye color, there's different alleles. These are different versions of it. So you could have a brown allele. You could have a green allele. Now, somewhere around 10,000 years ago, there was a mutation that occurred that gave us a new allele, blue. And so we first saw blue eyes. So mutations can cause us to get diversity because they can lead to these new alleles. And each new allele we have is kind of like adding a tool to our toolkit so that when the environment changes, which it will indefinitely over time, when the environment changes, we have to adapt. We have to cope with those changes. If we don't have the proper genes and alleles for those genes, to survive those changes, we can go extinct. And this has happened to many species. So it's important for species, it's important evolutionarily to make sure that you have mutations to provide for the diversity that we need. Now, granted, most of the time still, if you do have a mutation that changes things enough to notice, it's usually gonna be negative. So don't just start thinking like, yes, finally X-Men is accurate, no. You know, usually even if it does make things better, it doesn't make them so ridiculously much better. You don't become a superhero. You just become a person who can digest something a bit better. You know, you might be able to withstand more cold or more heat or more UV radiation. So these are normally not going to be gigantic leaps. It's just going to be small things, but those small things can be the difference between survival and extinction in some cases. Now, when a mutation occurs, there's two scenarios. The first that we talk about evolutionarily is the germline. So this is where a sex cell, such as a sperm, that's the sex cells males produce, or ova, these are essentially what are commonly referred to as eggs, even though they're not like chicken egg, uh, that females have. And these two will join together, and that's called fertilization. All right, fertilization. Now, fertilization produces this single cell called a zygote, that eventually divides to become whatever we are. So in our case, as a multicellular organism, this zygote continues to go on dividing until eventually it's produced all the cells in our body right now. So if I have a mutation that occurs in the germline, in these early cells, 
that means that the whole organism will have that mutation. So if this blue-eyed like mutation occurs, this allele occurs in a sperm cell, that means that zygote now has it and every cell of that organism has it. Its eyes have it and its own sperm and egg cells can have it. And so this one can be passed on to offspring. That's the important thing about a germline mutation is these ones are ones that will affect the future. So from an evolutionary standpoint, we care a lot about these because if this blue eye allele somehow makes it easier for you to survive or reproduce, it can then be passed on to your offspring. They can do a better job of surviving and reproducing and the prevalence, how common that allele is, can then increase to where eventually if it's a really good allele, you might see where almost all the population has it after a bunch of generations where individuals possessing it live better and or breed better because of it. Now there is another type of mutation that can't be passed on. So it's not really important in terms of the future, but it might matter for you. And these are called somatic mutations or body cell mutations. So these are things like a liver cell, a kidney cell, a skin cell, a brain cell. These are cells that are not reproductive. If my skin cell mutates, it is not going to get passed down to my offspring. It's just going to stay in that skin cell or whatever skin cells it produces as it divides because our cells can obviously divide. And so if that one says blue eyes and I have brown eyes, I still have brown eyes. This blue eye allele that's in my skin doesn't affect my eyes, it can't. And so it seems like, well, these wouldn't matter at all because they only affect one person. They just affect the individual that gets them they can't be passed on, so they're not important to a species like the germline ones. But we do have some of these mutations that can cause things like disease, such as cancer. And so from a medical standpoint, we will care about some of these somatic mutations because they can impact our health as an individual. And most people do care about themselves, so they want to be able to avoid things like cancer. Now, as we discuss the specifics, like Give me actual scenarios, you know, where I screw something up. We're going to start with the big picture, the big pieces where we mess things up. So if we really want to go big here in terms of causing mayhem, why don't we just focus on chromosomes? Because chromosomes are long pieces of DNA that have hundreds, sometimes thousands of genes on them. So if I can mess with these, I'm messing with a lot of genes all at once. This is a big impact. And so you can have simple things such as you can add a chromosome or chromosomes, I suppose. Uh, so for us, if we have 46 chromosomes normally, so I could have 47. This typically is not a good thing. This is not a case where more is better. Uh, if you have 47 chromosomes, most likely you're going to be negatively impacted or dead. The other way you can have this is the opposite. So we can essentially remove a chromosome or multiple chromosomes. For a scenario, I'll just take away one, and you could have 45. Once again, this is typically going to result in bad things or death. I guess death is probably a bad thing, but bad things where you live still or death. And so these are kind of the biggest ways we can screw things up. The other way we can screw things up is when we make our sperm and ova, when we make these sex cells. We have 23 types of chromosomes. We literally just number them, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up through essentially 23. We call the 23rd sex chromosomes, don't worry about it. Uh, but because we've got these types of chromosomes and we have two of each type, so for chromosome 1, I have two chromosome 1s. During this process of making sperm and ova, we will actually go through and trade equivalent pieces of chromosomes. So my chromosome 1 can kind of break off a chunk and swap it with the other chromosome 1. We call this crossing over. We'll get way more in depth of this later. But the idea here is that we will literally have chunks of chromosomes moving from one chromosome to the next. But they always do this in kind of a, a safe way is the goal, that we just do it between equivalents. So it's like me saying, all right, your arm's the same length as mine, so we're just going to go through and swap at the forearm, where it'd be the equivalent of kind of cutting it off, sewing the new one on, and overall I still have a functional arm. You know, this whole sewing back on thing worked perfectly. And so all it is is that I essentially have my upper arm and your lower arm, but I still have one complete functional arm. That's how crossing over is supposed to happen. But sometimes you go through and break a piece off to swap and you don't replace it. So that would be a deletion. 
You can also have where I break a piece off and I reattach my original plus the other guys. So now I've got like a double forearm, some weird situation, and that would be a duplication. Both of these, keep in mind, will tend to be bad. You know, these usually don't end well. And inversions where I like flip it. So I reattach it, but I reattach your piece of arm you gave me with the fingers where my forearm's supposed to be. So this is going to be very awkward, and in general it's going to cause bad things to happen. We call that an inversion. The other way we can screw up is we can start to mix and match different types of chromosomes. Because each type of chromosome, like chromosome 1, contains specific genes. Chromosome 2 contains different specific genes. So they're not interchangeable. So this would be a lot like for an insertion where somebody just gives me a piece of their leg and I attach it to my arm. So my arm now has like legs sticking off of it. That's an insertion, not good. You can also have a translocation, which is where I break off a piece of my arm, attach a piece of somebody's leg, and they attach a piece of my arm to their leg. So we've essentially swapped pieces, but the wrong pieces, not equivalent pieces. And so I've now got this arm leg and they have a leg arm. And once again, you can imagine this does not normally end well. So these are the bigger ways we can cause mutations, and most of these are not going to be a good thing. They're going to cause severe issues or death. Now, on a smaller scale, we can have point mutations where we're normally going to add, delete, or substitute, switch, one or just a few nucleotides. And this can go four basic ways. We'll discuss three of them here. So if I change out this adenine for a guanine, I change one amino acid. I'm not amino acid. I change one nucleotide. In this case, the codon, CAA and CAG, the codon that I changed still codes for the same amino acid. So overall, I have changed zero amino acids, which means I have not changed the protein. Even though I switched a nucleotide, nothing else changed. So we call that a silent mutation because the protein's identical to what it was supposed to be. Now, in a missense, sense, I still, in this case, in this example, am just changing one. But by changing just this one nucleotide, you'll see it does change this amino acid. It goes from GLU to PRO. But all I changed was one amino acid. So I didn't change a lot. You know, this protein might have a thousand amino acids. I changed one. And so there's a good chance that this protein still can do its job, or at least mostly do its job. So this might not be great, but it's normally not disastrous. The third type is a nonsense where I change, in this scenario, still one. We're keeping it simple. I change a cytosine to a uracil. But what happens is I change a normal codon that codes for a normal amino acid, and it now becomes a stop codon. So that means every amino acid after that mutation is going to be altered. So every amino acid after is changed. So this is going to be a severe mutation. This is kind of like you're writing a book out. You're copying it word for word from the original. And while you're doing it, you accidentally at one point just write the end. It could be mid-sentence. You know, it could be once upon the, and it's just done. Book is over. And so because of this, that protein is usually so different, it doesn't do anything at all like what it did originally it's normally completely non-functional. And if this is an important protein, you just got dead. All right. Now, the other type of severe mutation we have is a frame shift, where if we add or delete nucleotides, like one or two of them, because remember, we read in threes. So if I don't add or delete them in threes, in which case I only affect one amino acid, but if I were to add or remove just a single nucleotide, or just two, because I have to read it in threes, everybody else has to shift. So we shift our reading frame. That's why it's called the frame shift, because we have to read it in threes. So if I get rid of this T in the fat cat ate the fat rat, this is just an analogy, uh, if I do that, everybody else has to shift over because I have to read it in threes. And so the C of cat now becomes the third guy in what used to be fat. So the fat cat, we now have the fat at a tet half a adder at. Everybody after there, so once again, every amino acid after this mutation is affected. So if this occurs in the middle or the beginning of a gene, it's going to be disastrous because pretty much every amino acid in that protein is going to be altered in some way, which means the chances of that protein, even it a little bit functioning like it used to, is pretty much null.
you know, it's not going to happen. That protein's pretty much ruined. And because we've said when you change a protein, it normally doesn't make it better, we've probably just destroyed one of the proteins. And if it's essential, we've killed ourselves. If it's something not absolutely essential, we've at least gotten rid of one protein that we could have used. And there's a decent chance that that's going to have some negative impact. And so frame shift mutations will be the other type of mutation that's a point mutation. You know, small changes, but still has the potential to be very severe in its effect. That's it for mutations, guys. Hope you enjoyed it.